Hello, I'm Jim Mahalik from UiPath. Today with me, I have Mike Madden Jones from Home Depot. Mike, thanks for agreeing to sit down and chat with us. Thanks, Jim. I uh, appreciate you having me. Looking forward to it. Mike, tell us your title and a little bit about your role, what you do at Home Depot. Sure. So uh, it's Mike Madden Jones. I oversee the online merchandising solutions org. So um, within Home Depot as a retailer, uh, just a level set on merchandising, you know, merchandising is king. It's at the core of everything we do. Um, you know, the, the merchants and merchandising groups will kind of set the retails. They own the supplier relationships. They work with the suppliers to get those costs. They define that assortment you're going to see in our stores and online. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, merchandising is on the hook for what we refer to as the P&L segment, the profit and loss. So, you know, we think about every um, individual merchant as really their own business in a sense, right? And interconnected merchandising solutions, my group um, is at the forefront of kind of merchandising support. So it started as a merchandising operations group. So there's a lot that goes into running these billion dollar companies and we were assisting with that. And then over the years, we've evolved it into, um, while retaining a lot of those operational components, we've kind of naturally moved into a lot of automation activities and then a lot of analytical activities as well to try to help drive kind of a best in class decision support at scale for that merchandising org. Well, thanks, that gives us a great overview. And so Home Depot is obviously a very large organization. And as you just described merchandising, obviously it's quite a challenging, quite a challenging endeavor. How did you decide where to start your automation initiatives at Home Depot? Yeah, uh, great question. So we were in a little bit of a unique situation in that, um, just to be totally candid, that, you know, our IT partners kind of took the plunge before us. And, and partnered with UiPath and brought in some licenses a couple years ago uh, to see where this could go. One of the things that they decided to do was open it up to what is traditionally a, a business side team, which is our group. So we honestly, we got called into a meeting one day with IT and they kind of gave us this present, this gift, right? And, and you, don't, you don't go into a lot of meetings like that with IT. Usually they're kind of looking for IT capital and whatnot. But to, on this day, they gave us this gift. They said, we have this new software. We believe that you don't actually have to be a uh, full stack dev to make this work. Um, we're gonna give you guys some licenses and see how it goes. So for us, um, it was really, we, we have a lot, a couple of years ago when we were heavier in the operational space, a lot of what we were doing was very manual it's manual tasking, right? It, we own the merchandising attribution of the products online. So, you know, when something, when you're shopping homedepot.com and you see the ability to buy online, pick up in store, and you don't see that on another product, all of that was defined and routed through our group, but it's all kind of manually maintained attributes in a PIM solution. Um, so the, the most immediate low hanging fruit for us to kind of figure out if this new toy that we got could get legs was a lot of the day over day kind of item maintenance. Um, so whereas previously reports would run and a file would be sent to someone who had to open the file, kind of run some checks on that file and then upload it every day to, to kind of uh, affect those changes that you saw on homedepot.com. We started sending a lot of those files uh, to bots, to UiPath, right? So mm. we saw there that um, this could probably be something that could really, like I said, get legs and, and have a nice solid impact for us. We started to see um, labor hours free up. You know, we talk about capacity release, right? So the person that was receiving all these files every day, running these rules and macros and then uploading these files, now that they don't have to do that, we can move them over to more strategic projects. So how many processes today do you have automated within Home Depot or at least within merchandising? UiPath um, is happening in a, in a couple different orgs, right? RPA is, is relatively widespread. There's some activities going on in supply chain, HR finance, right? HR and finance are probably the more traditional areas that you hear about. Um, right. Supply chain has some really cool stuff going on as well. And then we're kind of the point of contact within merchandising. At 18 months now, uh, I would say we're around 50 processes automated uh, that we are kind of feel good about and very proud of. 
50 processes. Wow. How did you get the employees engaged? I mean, it sounds like you've got a very enthusiastic group there. So how did you get your employees engaged to want to uh, experiment with this and then roll this out for themselves and others? A couple different groups to touch on there. On, on the side that is now, because we have, there's one team that was an operational team and, and the RPA has just taken off so much that that team is almost solely flipped to RPA devs. So that group it was pretty easy to get them excited into it because it's a, hey, you were closing tickets and punching buttons. If you can figure out the software, you're going to be kind of on a different path. So so they latched on and they've been doing a great job there um, since then. Uh, for the groups where we're now partnering, um, it is it, there's a little bit of a balance that, that you have to do there, right? So, you, you know, uh, automation traditionally, there's always that concern for some folks of, uh, oh, if I talk to the automation guys, am I going to automate myself out of a, a, a job? <laughs> Which is not true. That, that's not really what we're about. We're, we are about capacity release. We are not about um, shrinking headcount, right? Uh, we want you to be working on more strategic initiatives, things that require kind of your ability to think subjectively, not just kind of pressing buttons. So there's a lot right. of communication on that front. There's a lot of road showing. There's a lot of meetings to kind of get people over that hump. Some other things we've done, um, we have, uh, I feel like we're pretty strong on branding our RPA efforts. So we, we have named all of our bots. Um, they do have uh, icons associated with them, kind of cartoon characters, if you will. Uh, and people honestly have really latched on to that. Um, you know, our leadership really finds the, the, the humanization of the bots to be a, a, a good play. Um, so, you know, that is something I, I would recommend, um, you know, giving it a name, having a little fun with it. Don't don't you know, don't squash the creativity. It's OK to to have fun. It doesn't all have to be kind of, you know, our names are kind of out there. Right. And I think the group has fun with that and it resonates with the the partners we're trying to work with. Excellent. Now you mentioned uh, capacity release and. When we talked earlier, you and I, you mentioned there were three kind of key metrics that drive decisions like this to do them. Top line growth or top line impact, cost takeout and capacity release. And you've been talking a lot about capacity release. How has automation helped deliver on the other two? Sure. So, um, you know, getting back to where we started, we are a retailer, right? So so our, our mission to our shareholders is to uh, drive sales, right? Create dollars profitably. Um, so in that sense, you know, automation at its core will always indirectly affect sales or cost out in some capacity. But if you can find those automations where it is a more direct connection to a top line impact on an automation, you know, that's really what will get uh, more attention with your leaders. Right. I mean, you're going to kind of get on radars faster if you can show that kind of impact. We. Um, we have a handful of examples where we're doing things like that. Uh, we have a, a, a strong automation in one product category uh, that we're kind of building out as a proof of concept that's done very well uh, around um, fulfillment updates. So, mm. um, you know, our assortment is either stocked where we own it and we'll have it in a warehouse and when you buy it, we'll ship it to you. And we, we've owned that inventory and we're shipping it out to you. Or we work with a lot of suppliers in a drop ship capacity where you know, they'll retain ownership of the inventory until it's purchased online um, and then they'll facilitate kind of the shipping, right? Uh, like a consignment approach? All, yeah, um, all major online retailers have some semblance of, you know, right. what what do we have stocked versus drop ship? Uh, but a lot of times you'll have the same item where we're going to buy X amount of units and stock it. And once those sell through, we're going to go back to drop ship. And your cost on the dropship is probably a little bit higher, but you're still getting the sales dollars. So that that's right. an exercise that we manually maintained to flip between those two fulfillment channels. Mm -hmm. So somebody was kind of watching our stocked inventory, and as it it petered down, you know, taking the steps to flip to that other inventory, um, we've been able to use RPA to 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 take on a lot of that activity in, in a category, right? And I think it's something that can get some legs. Obviously, there's there's different hoops to jump through in each product category that make each one unique. Um, but that's one where you you can tie that to a top line impact um, fairly quickly and, and really get kind of more eyeballs on um, what you're doing. 
Now, you had mentioned that that headcount reduction was not a focus for you guys when you did uh, automation. Uh, so what other cost takeout activities have you focused on to help drive cost out of, uh, of your P&L? Sure. So on the cost out side, um, there was there are certain um, third party expenses that we've been able mm -hmm. to supplement. So when you think about data acquisitions and um, softwares that you're using, uh, to pull kind of reporting on a week over week basis or to procure data in a certain capacity. Um, moving that over to an RPA group uh, or activity where you have a license and you're good to go, um, we have been able to get out of some of those those other uh, third party acquisition data uh, data acquisition um, contracts that we've been in. So we, we've seen good progress there as well. Oh, excellent. Well, a lot of people who are watching now may be new to the automation journey. Uh, you guys have been successful at it. So looking back on your successes, what are three to five things you would tell somebody who's just starting out on this journey um, to, to help bring you success? Maybe some uh, traps to avoid and, and tips to learn from. Yeah, uh, great question. So, it, you know, there's, there's a couple things that immediately come to mind. Uh, one, first and foremost, your leadership buy-in is key, right? Uh, this is going to be hard to do on an island. This is going to be hard to do without your leadership invested in the same goals as you are. So you've got to do whatever kind of marketing roadshow presentations, whatever you've got to do in terms of showing that there is ROI here and getting that leadership on board. And once you have that executive sponsorship, uh, that is the first kind of step to unlocking automation's kind of full potential, if you will. Uh, another thing I'd say to be on the lookout for, uh, you know, talent, talent is key. Talent is a big deal. Um, we've, we've been really lucky. You know, I feel like we hire really well. And then our kind of our first wave of developers were all self-taught. Now we're kind of hiring people with some RPA experience, bringing that to the table. You, you've got to find um, some strong devs to bring in. Because uh, when you first start out, it's kind of, hey, this is fun. And we're, we're kind of just doing what we're doing and seeing if it goes anywhere. That second wave of talent is going to need to bring in a little bit of structure and process uh, to mm -hmm. how you operate, the operating rhythm of your team. So, you know, we've kind of evolved into a group that now has coding standards, right? We're running agile. We have standups. We're doing uh, code reviews. Uh, and, and you've got to have the talent um, that can, can get you continue to evolve in that direction you want to uh, in that capacity. And then, you know, another one that comes to mind is, uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. This is a journey. This is going to take, this is going to take a while, right? I mean, you, you shouldn't just think, Hey, we're, we're getting RPA and in six months, everything's going to be automated. This is good. This is going to take a while, right? You're going to have some resources dedicated to start, um, but you should have, when you're planning, think of like a three to five year plan, what this all looks like. One of the things that we've done, um, is that automation was happening in, in kind of pockets throughout Home Depot. Right. And we, we saw that, yes, we were all kind of chip away at the same goal, but if we were able to centralize some of those resources and at least get together and talk about what we were doing, share best practices, kind of get some of that governance in place around, um, the infrastructure asks and things of that nature. Um, so we did, we stood up a center of excellence. Uh, I would call it a federated model, um, but we stood okay. one up, call it a year ago. Uh, that's been a great win for us as well. And you, you mentioned something I think is also a key to, to those. Once the enthusiasm hits, and you mentioned how enthusiastic your organization is, um, <clears throat> so the requests start coming in likely pretty quickly. Um, what kind of governance guidance would you give for those who are find themselves all of a sudden inundated happily with a lot of requests for new automations? Yeah, great problem to have. I love looking at the backlog and just seeing all kinds of stuff in there. Um, you're going to have to uh, build out an assessment, an assessment model, right? And, and you're going to have to get in a situation where you're working with your, your business stakeholders and you're evaluating kind of the business value when we go back to those three metrics of top line impact cost out or capacity release versus the level of effort that's going to be on the team. And, and, you know, it's kind of one of those matrices where you, you're kind of plotting dots across those two um, to say what the, the biggest business value against our core metrics 
that makes sense when you look at the level of effort against everything else that's been stacked up in our backlog. But those are those are good days, right? I mean, you, you love to see that that very significant backlog because there's just a ton of opportunity and there's a ton of just better work that our resources can be doing than than these kind of mundane press the button type activities that they've been lulled into kind of over the years. Well, Mike, I know we could probably talk about these topics for hours, but uh, I really thank you for your time today. It's been very informative and uh, we look forward to working with you going forward. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. Have a great day. Appreciate it.